It's time to take a new approach to finding true fulfillment in your career, health, and state of mind through insightful conversations with those who have found their professional and personal passions while achieving balance. Whether it's entrepreneurs, athletes, or healthcare professionals, we bring you real people, real growth, right here on the Boost Podcast. Now, here's your host, Elena Lipson. Hey, Boo Squad, and welcome to episode eight. Elena Lipson here, and I am so psyched to introduce today's featured guest, Param Joggy. Param, are you ready to join the Boo Squad? I am ready to join the Boo Squad. Awesome. We're super happy to have you here. So Param is the 22-year-old CEO of Hatch, which is a website that lets you build a mobile app without code for free. And he has quite an interesting background. From dropping out of Vanderbilt University to consulting as a design engineer, research associate, and even a rocket scientist. So he's been an innovator since the age of 13 and was named to the 2012 and 2013 Forbes 30 Under 30 Energy List for his work in green technologies. Most recently, he even created a 2016 election game that was kind of like Cards Against Humanity meets the 2016 elections, and the game went viral three times. So welcome, Parham. Let's just get right into it. So Parham, what are the three things that we should know about building a mobile app without code? Yeah, definitely. So I think the first thing about Hatch in general is that we're trying to change the perception of how people go about building software. Um, In the past, it used to be that you go find someone that's uh, smart and knows how to code, or you go work with an offshore team in Asia or Europe. And then you pay them a lot of money, and then they pop out this app or a website. Um, we're trying to change the perception and allow non-technical folks to be able to feel like they can do what developers can do. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the time that it takes to get a mobile app up. Um, in the past, it's always been, it takes months to a year to uh, build out a mobile app. And we're trying to build out a point-click platform that lets you build a sophisticated app within minutes. And then third is the is the money component. Traditionally, software development, you you charge up front, you charge a lot of money up front, like fifty thousand dollars to hundred thousand dollars up front. What we do is we're trying to change that model on its head. So we we charge you monthly, a small amount monthly, to use all the tools that are under hatch. Wow. So that sounds pretty disruptive to go and allow pretty much anyone without a technical background to go and get an app up and running within minutes at a very low price. So that's pretty revolutionary. When you look at this field and this business, like what do you see now and in the future? Because you know you don't hear about a lot of people doing this. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, before I started Hatch, I was trying to figure out, and I was looking at the history of technology, and I realized that, and with every new technology that came out, at some point or the other, there was a democratization of the entire field. So it happened with computers back in the day, right? With computers used to be the the size of a room, and then and then now we have little MacBooks that we can carry around. It happened with websites, with website builders like WordPress, Weebly, and Wix. The next generation is, is all mobile. And so when I was trying to figure out what to, what to start as a company, I, I was looking at where's technology heading. And I realized that this democratization of technology is, is an inevitable truth that's going to take place. And so then I, I said, why don't, why don't we start with mobile apps and then go from there? Very cool. So, you know, you started at this at a very young age. You were 13 years old and you've really been an innovator in this field. And it's very interesting that you started so young. You dropped out of college. You're a CEO. You're having a lot of success. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey as well as three tactics that you've used to really grow this business? Yeah, definitely. So I got really involved with science and technology at a young age. And I think it was based on my innate curiosity about the world. I was a kid that always had a lab in my bedroom and I would basically sleep on one side and then just tinker with like toys, Legos, robots on the other. And so when I wasn't at school, I was always just building something or taking something apart in my house, which didn't go well with my parents. And then, you know, as I grew older, when I was about 12 or 13, I started doing science fair projects and entering into local science fair competitions. And that's, you know, when I really got inspired that I realized that you can use science technology to build products that people will actually use. And so one of my first products was, it was called the EcoTube, and it was a device that reduces carbon emissions from cars. The premise was to use algae to reduce carbon dioxide and from the exhaust of any motor vehicle and convert it into oxygen. And so that was one of the first projects that I ever did. And I, I worked on it throughout my short time at Vanderbilt and then a couple of years afterwards. And I think what I realized was that half of what I was doing was 
was the actual science technology product piece of it. And half of what I was doing was the empowerment piece and the inspiration piece. Because at the, at the end of the day, the product was an eight inch cylindrical canister that fit, fit off your exhaust pipe. But what it stood for was so much more. And in that process of talking to a lot of folks, I realized that there's a lot of people out, out there that have really good ideas. They just don't know how to go about making them into reality. So that's where the inspiration for Hatch originally came from, where um, I was trying to figure out how, how can we build something that empowers and kind of democratizes the, the playing field. And so I'm not sure if that answered the question, but uh, I've been rambling a lot. Great. No, that's great. So it's actually given me a lot of other questions I want to ask you. And I think that we will all learn a lot from some of these answers. So one thing is you said you just started building things, taking them apart. It kind of seems, uh, it blows my mind really to hear, you know, just from doing that, then you come up with this whole eco tube. I'm sure it was more of a journey than like you just rolled out of bed and played with some Legos. And then next thing you know, you have this great innovation. But so did you have other influences along the way? Like were your parents supportive of this? I mean, you were doing things different than what most 13 year olds were doing with their time at that age. And so I'm just curious of sort of how you found your way here and what type of support you had, or if people were telling you like, this is crazy, what are you doing with your time? Yeah, definitely. It was honestly a mixture of both. My parents were always really supportive and they it was probably a result of uh, being raised by Indian immigrants that there was a huge uh, focus on education, math and science. And so basically laying these like first order principles within me that, that then I could apply to any sort of field. And so that with the combination of just being innately curious about the world around me, it really got me into inventing science, technology. You know, as I grew older, I think I was wired a bit differently than most students. Most students, if they present an idea to an adult and the adult says, that's crazy, you should be quiet and get back to work, they kind of take that and, and they listen, right? Because, because that's what you're taught to do is to listen to the adults. For some reason, for me, it was when, when people told me that it wasn't possible, that I shouldn't worry about it, that was, that was fuel to my fire. And so it gave me more energy to keep working on, on my projects. And so I think it was just, it was a combination of having a support system around me, but then also just being ambitious from a young age. I love that. And what I really want you to take from what he's saying is that we all have naysayers when we're sitting here thinking about a new idea and and something that hasn't been done before. But it's that innate curiosity that Parham talked about, along with an ability to think different and just be ambitious and push ahead anyways, that's going to get you to that next level. You know, if you just let everyone who tells you something can't be done get to you, you're never going to find out if it can be done or not. So I think those are some really important points that you made there. Can you talk a little bit more about Hatch and when you started Hatch and sort of where the company is at now and how you grew it from, you know, inception to where you are today? Yeah, definitely. So I started Hatch about a year and a half ago in my apartment, literally just had my laptop and put up the website and started building the product. And so we started about a year ago and I brought on a co-founder, one of my best friends, Amelia Friedman. And in the past year or so, it's been a crazy ride. So at one point, we our bank account fell to less than $20. And so we launched the 2016 election game that you mentioned at the beginning. So we launched it as a side project to basically fund Hatch. We were inspired by the story by the guys that started Airbnb. When they started, they, uh, they couldn't raise money. And so they went out and sold cereal boxes in 2008 called Obama's and Captain McCain's. So inspired by them, we launched the 2016 election game to fund Hatch. That went viral. And we uh, we took the profits, and that allowed us to basically keep keep developing the platform. And so this past summer, we went through the YC fellowship, the Y Combinator fellowship. Then we raised a small seed round from angel investors in uh, the Washington D.C. area, and then we finally launched the product as well. And so now, basically, the hatch is it's out in the public. We haven't done a formal public launch, or we're still trying to kind of iterate on the product. But now you can go to our website, hatchapps.com, pick a template sign up for either the free or the premium tier. You can drag and drop some elements and uh, deploy your mobile app. So our most sophisticated template is a marketplace template that lets you build a peer-to-peer marketplace. And it takes care of everything from the design, hosting, the payments infrastructure. It lets you get paid in the middle. So the, the value proposition of Hatch is that you get a focus on your idea and your startup, and we take care of all the nonsense on the back end. Wow, that's great. Definitely makes me think of ideas of how I want to use that to build apps for some of my own business because I currently don't have any, but you know, I'd always, we should talk afterwards. Yeah, I know. I always assumed that it took a lot of money, a lot of developers, but when you hear how like lightweight and easy this is, it's kind of like, well, why not try it? So um, I think that's great. I can even see how this would be relevant for my own business. And you know, you guys might 
see how it could be relevant for your endeavors as well. So I want to go back to something you said. I really like how you talked about that moment where you had less than $20 left in your bank account. And, you know, that's pretty scary, but that you went and looked for inspiration somewhere else. So probably wasn't your dream to like come up with an election game. Obviously, your dream has been more in other places, given some of the pursuits that you have gone after. But, you know, you realized that there was an opportunity there. The election was going on, there was a lot of interest. So why not capitalize on it? And you were able to find a way to have a quick solution to a very immediate problem. And that's just some of the ways that we need to be thinking about, you know, when you hit on hard times, Maybe it's not continuing to go down that road. Maybe it's taking a break for a minute, just doing something to get some money or the momentum you need to keep going. And I I like how you've really done that here. I also want to talk a little bit about how you're using this with marketplaces, you said. And I want to learn a little bit more about who your ideal customer you think would be for Hatch and sort of how you've decided on that customer. Yeah, definitely. So this has actually been one of our uh, biggest problems internally is to try to figure out who is that ideal customer. Because we're building this holistic building platform, it applies to a a big enterprise and it also applies to a kid in India that's selling bananas on the streets, right? And so it applies to everyone in the middle. So one of the biggest things we we had to learn really fast, and especially after we took investor money, was that we need to focus. We need to figure out who, who is our exact target customer. So right now we're going after basically highly ambitious, non technical founders of businesses. But what we found is that just through our network, many friends, people we associate ourselves with, there, there's plenty of people that have great business ideas. They just they don't know the know-how of, of how to code, how to how to put up a website or an app. And so the value proposition is that you know we find people that are ambitious that will keep coming back to the Hatch platform, and they're incentivized to to make their app a success. And so they they serve to be the best uh, use case for us. That being said, on the other side of the spectrum is that because they're they're very ambitious, and uh, the hope is that their apps are going to take off. Sooner or later, they don't have a need for Hatch, right? Because then they can go out and raise investor money, hire a development team, and then do it themselves, right? And so there's still a lot of things that we're we're trying to figure out from a business model standpoint. The last year or so has been has been hyper focused on the product and making sure that we're building something that people uh, people love and and keep and want to um, come back to. But there's still a lot of things to figure out. Yeah, I think that's a really great idea, though. I mean, you look at more and more people getting into the gig economy and going to work for themselves. And a lot of you listening, I think, probably are thinking of ideas that you want to do and had really never thought about using an app. But this could be a way to really help your business scale because you're able to reach more people in a much more economical way than, you know, if you had to go hire developers and a whole team to create an app for you. So as I mentioned before, this is something that, you know, I need to think more about for my business. And I'm sure a lot of us can really benefit from a service like this. Moving a little bit to something you spoke about before was, you know, you mentioned that time when you had less than $20 in your bank account. Can you either talk more about that or another time that you stopped making progress and the real process that you kind of went through to get back on track? Yeah, definitely. So I think the election game is the the best example of that. Um, so kind of the backstory there was it was a Friday and we needed funds pretty quickly. And so we had less than $20 left in the bank account. And so it was a Friday afternoon and we were feeling a little burnt out. We had been working on the product. We hadn't raised any money. We were not taking a salary for about six months. And then it really gets to you and you kind of lose that entrepreneurial spirit when you're when you're back against the wall. So one, we were trying to figure out how can we reinvigorate that entrepreneurial spirit. And two, we were trying to figure out how can we make money doing something really fast. And so over the weekend, we we came up with the idea, we put up a website, we printed out some cards and took some pictures. We put up the an online store uh, with one of the website builders. And then on Monday, on Monday morning, we launched the site. And it was pretty crazy because over the next few months, what we found was that because of what was going on in the elections, the, the card game just absolutely took off and it became its own business. Within a week, we had to create an LLC and basically create a company around around the card game to protect ourselves because it was because it was going viral. But then over the next three months, what we realized was that we were spending so much time fulfilling orders, doing customer support, getting into retail stores, basically growing this little micro business that we had taken a complete detour from Hatch. Um, and then a point came in. So this is between January and March of 2016. The point came where we realized that we need to kind of get back on track on Hatch because we realized that the upsides are very different, right? So the, the upside for the election game was that we could make a few hundred thousand dollars. The upside for Hatch is that we changed the way software is developed. 
And so it's it's a different order of magnitude in the way of thinking about it. But that that all being said, when we got time to get back to work on Hatch, we we felt reinvigorated. We had the funds to keep moving with the company. And also the I mean, the ancillary benefit was that as a founding team, we realized that when our back's against the wall, we have enough confidence to know that, that we'll be able to figure it out. That's great. And I think that confidence is key because we're all hit with moments of self-doubt, especially when we hit something like $20 left in our bank account. And you have to find ways to overcome that and to really believe in what you're doing and your team, or else, you know, if if you can't move past that, you're really never going to pull yourself out of those holes when you get into them and when you're backed up against the wall with something unpleasant. And so I think that's really interesting to bring confidence up. Another thing that you talked about was like, you realize you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars off this game. And that's great for the short term. And you could keep creating game after game after game and keep this as its own business. And it's totally respectable and lucrative. But you really had a bigger dream. And I think that's a tough balance for a lot of people because it's like, do you pursue this dream that may not make you money ever or may take a couple years? Or do you go after what seems like a sure thing and it'll give you a nice income for the next couple of years? And I'm sure that a lot of people probably, you know, put their dreams on hold so that they can go pursue the immediate money because they have bills to pay. And, you know, when you find something that works, it's like, why not go with it? But I think that speaks a lot to your passion for what you're doing, that you didn't do that and that you didn't take yourself too far away from Hatch because, you know, if you wait too long, the whole market will change or someone else might come in with the same idea. And that's something that we need to think about a lot when we start to think about, you know, waiting or seeing what the market does or waiting till the product gets just right. Sometimes you do that and the barriers to entry are not so small in a certain industry and then someone's already come in and beat you to the punch. So there is something to be said by like sticking to your momentum and and pushing through and not putting things on hold for too long. I think your story really illustrates that very well. Yeah, definitely. One of my uh, my role models, uh, Reid Hoffman, he's a CEO uh, CEO or one of the founders of LinkedIn. I don't know know if he's still CEO, but he has this famous quote that says that, if you're not embarrassed by your the first version of your product launch, then you launch too late. Um, <laughs> basically saying that, you know, we always like we always think that we always like give ourselves excuses to wait. And the hardest part is just putting yourself out there and then iterating over time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can say even launching this podcast for me is a totally new venture than anything I ever did. And probably the scariest part of it is putting myself out there. You know, I have to promote myself. I have to record myself. And these are things I was comfortable doing. But, you know, you could sit at home and fret over it and never do it. Or you can just go out and take a chance and see what happens. So I totally hear you on that. A little bit of a different direction I want to go in. So you're 22 years old. You spent from the time you're about 13 till now working on all these cool things and really trying to improve the world through green technology and through democratizing technology for non-techies that might want to build an app and scale their businesses. But how have you created a work-life balance and what do you do to take time to take care of yourself when you're not working? Yeah, that's something I think a lot about. The short answer is is, is a complete lack of sleep. The, the longer answer is that I think I was very fortunate and privileged that at a young age, I was able to find what I, I'm really passionate about and really care about. And I think a lot of people spend most of, the, most of their lives trying to find that one thing. And for me, it just kind of stumbled into my life when I was really young. And so I've had a lot of time to think about, I mean, a lot of time relatively to think about how do I balance this like work and play when it all feels like work and play, right? Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, for me, it's I've realized in the past year or two since I've been running Hatches that it is important to take breaks and it is important to kind of strike a balance because it reinvigorates you. It, it kind of gives you the energy to keep going. That being said, I mean, for me, I, I just feel lucky that when I come into work, I on Sunday night, I get excited that I finally get to go into work again on Monday morning. And and yeah, I mean, when all my friends have anxiety going like going into work, I mean, it's, it's because they have like most people haven't figured out what they actually care about. And so I guess the long answer is that strike your balance is good. But at the same time, you, you don't want it to feel like actual work. Yeah, I hear you. I love what you said about looking for something that on Sunday evening, you're excited to go to work on Monday. I think what you're saying is so true that, you know, everyone dreads Mondays for the most part. And if you can find a profession or a calling that is something that doesn't actually always feel like work and you're super excited to go, then, then, you know, finding balance is not going to feel as much like you had to carve it out separately because you're not feeling like you're doing something that feels like work all the time. So I really get what you're saying there. Um, Well, let's go ahead and close out with a parting piece of guidance from you. You've already shared a lot of wisdom with us, and I know that 
we definitely want to hear your parting piece of guidance. If I had one piece of advice to give, I would say that it's all about grit. Right? And, and I think this kind of ties back to the point that sooner or later, your back is going to be against the wall. And you just kind of have to remember why you're doing what you're doing. And the founders, the, the people that do the best in life are the ones that never give up, never take no for an answer, never let certain circumstances or market forces kind of predicate their future, right? Like they put things in their own hands. And so and there's been a countless number of studies that show that the, the number one indicator of success is grit. I think it's one thing to, to say that you have grit, and then the other is when your back's against the wall is to, is to keep trekking forward. Absolutely. I love that. So I hope you all are really taking note of this. It is all about grit. What are you going to do when your back is against the wall? Don't give up. Don't take no for an answer. You need to keep pushing forward if you believe in your idea, and then it will happen. So I hope today's episode inspires you to think more about how you can find your passion and live your best life. For more information, including links to resources that Param and I chatted about today and how best to get in touch with him, head on over to our website, www.theboostpodcast.com and check out our show notes from the episode and catch the boost bonus. Param, I want to thank you for sharing your journey with us today. And remember, anything is possible for you. Now that you've completed this episode, the next step is to join the Boost Squad for strategic insights, tips, and tricks, as well as exclusive resources designed specifically to accelerate your personal and professional growth. All this and more is waiting for you at theboostpodcast.com.